So in the second stanza, we have this language that indicates the profane versus the sacred. So talking about we're profanation of our joys to tell the lay to our love. This is spiritual language. It would be profane. It would be anti-spiritual to tell the laity of our love. The laity is a very specific word. The opposite would be the clergy. So you've got, as part of the clergy, you've got the priests, pastors, missionaries, spiritual people. And the laity are the lay people, the people that just come to church and worship. So you've got the people who are the teachers, and you've got the people who are the learners in a spiritual concept. So what the speaker is saying is that we are the teachers of the spiritual. We are the spiritual leaders when it comes to this sort of love. And then he's going to go on and he's going to compare on the fourth stanza to the people that aren't the spiritual leaders of this type of love. We'll get there in a second. The third stanza, we've got this lovely image between uh, moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Talking about earthquakes. When the earth moves, it hurts people and it makes people afraid. People think about what does it mean? What is it here for? Even today in our world, we have earthquakes and we have people saying it's the end times. The end of the world is nigh. Look at how this world is falling apart. And then Don goes on to contrast the moving of the earthquakes with the moving of the spheres of the planets. So the planets are moving around the sun. And this is much, much greater movement. But yet at the same time, nobody notices that. I mean, we notice the moon moving. We notice us moving around the sun. But it doesn't give us as much fear as a little earthquake. So he's going to compare that to, to his, his love separating. So when it talks about moving the earth brings harms and fears. So a little, a little uh, separation, right? Versus a big separation. It's, it's, it shouldn't be a big deal. Fourth stanza, it talks about the dull sublunary lover's love. Sublunary. This is under the moon. You know, when John, when Don wrote this, he believed, or people believed, that um, that the moon played a very strong role in people's lives. In fact, people around here believe that when students are acting badly, they say, oh, it's the moon. It's a full moon, whether that's true or not. But what he's doing is he's saying that the people whose love is based on the physical and that's in the stanza as well. Their love is based on the moon. The moon is traditionally associated with, with instability, with lunacy, lunacy from the moon, luna, craziness. Werewolves, when the moon comes out, they go crazy. It's an unstable sort of love. So their love whose soul is sense. Their soul, again, a very spiritual word. Their soul is sense, which means that their feelings are only about what they can sense, what they can see. Cannot admit of absence, because it doth remove those things which element it. They can't stand absence. Because if they're apart from their lovers, these are the people whose soul are sense. If they are apart from their lovers, then they stop loving. Because the physical is gone. But, and then we've got a transition here. A transition between... The, uh, between the sublunary lovers and the speaker and his lover. But we by a love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is, interassured of the mind, care less eyes, lips, and hands to miss. Our love is so refined we don't know what it is. <coughs> and we are interassured of the mind. We are assured of our love. And here we've got an example of synecdoche. Interassured of the mind, care less eyes, lips, and hands to miss. So what he's saying is, and this sounds harsh, but it doesn't matter if we're missing the eyes, lips, and hands. It's not that they don't care. It's not that they don't care that they're apart from each other. But it's not going to cause this huge, oh my goodness, she's gone. I can't see her. Our love is over. It's not going to cause that. So when the speaker says, I'm, going, I'm not going to miss her eyes. I'm not going to miss her lips. I'm not going to miss her hands. Really, this is, um, this is a way of saying I'm not going to miss her. So synecdoche, this is referring to something, using something else that's associated with the first thing. The lover has eyes, lips, and hands. 
and she, the, uh, the speaker is using the eyes, lips, and hands to refer to the lover. This would be an example of Zemecki. <clears throat> and the next slide also could be interpreted as Zemecki, but we've got to unpack it a little bit. When he says, our two souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go, endure not get a breach. And I'll talk about that image in a second. Our two souls, which are one, must endure a breach. This would be an example of synecdoche if the speaker is referring to the souls as selves. Sometimes when you're reading or when you hear a news report, you, you, you might have heard the expression, five souls were lost with the ship. Okay? Depending on your own beliefs, this could be an example of synecdoche or metonymy. If you believe that humans have souls and that it's actually a part of them, then if you refer to somebody as a soul, that would be an example of synecdoche, because they have it. If not, if you don't believe in souls, then this would be an example of metonymy, because it's something that's associated with people. But in this poem, we know that the speaker is spiritual, because we're using words like profane and laity. Or we know this. So when he's saying, our two souls, therefore, which are one, must endure a breach, the speaker is probably talking about their actual souls. Our souls are one. This is metaphorical language here. But as I said, the speaker probably believes that they have souls. So depending on your particular theological slant, this could be autonomy, this could be synecdoche, this could be just pure metaphor. But it depends on your interpretation. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you how to interpret the poem. That's up to you. I'm just telling you what I think. We could use this as metonymy if we wanted. Yes. You may use this as metonymy. Sure. Endure not yet a breach but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness beat. I don't have my, my ring here, but gold, when you beat it, it doesn't just shatter, it bends, because gold is very soft. So, like gold to airy thinness beat. If you take a gold ring, and if you take a hammer, it's like soft gold, you take a hammer and you beat it, it's going to smush. You beat it long enough, it's going to become very flat. Just like he's saying, like gold to airy thinness beat. So what he's saying is that the hammer is our separation. And you can hammer this gold ring or this piece of gold as much as you want, but it's not going to cause a breach. It's not going to break. It's just going to spread apart. That's a lovely metaphor because they are moving apart, right? So it's just going to get longer and our love is still going to be one. And then in the final three stanzas, we have this extended metaphor about a compass. But not a compass north-south, but a compass that you use in math. So, two points, right? If they be two, they are two so, as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. So we all know what a compass looks like. We need to imagine that the lover who's staying behind is the fixed foot, <clears throat> and the man, or the person who's moving, is going to be the, the one that's, that's over here. So when you move the compass, the middle one bends towards it, if, especially if it's a larger circle. So it bends. So the stiff twin compasses, even though they're apart, they're still moving together. They're still part of the same instrument. Yet in, though in it in the center sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it, and grows erect as the other comes home. So, if you spread out the circle, if you spread out the compass very wide, they're leaning towards each other, but as the, the compass that's coming home gets closer, they lean back towards each other. Then which one's erect? The one in the middle. The one that's erect is the one in the middle, the one that's staying behind. Because the other one is moving around, right? But the one in the center is a point, and it's just staying there. Such wilt thou be to me, who must let the other foot obliquely run. Thy firmness makes my circle just, and makes me end where I begun. <clears throat> this is the extended metaphor. It's another way for the speaker to show that even though they're separate, even though they're apart, nothing's going to happen. They're just going to endure a little separation. It's just going to be a little bit of time where the two points are apart. But eventually, they know that they're going to come back together and everything is going to be just fine. So, in this poem, 
We've seen synecdoche, we've seen metonymy, we've seen extended simile and metaphor. There's a lot going on in here. It's a very complex and a very rich poem that is talking about a spiritual relationship as opposed to a purely physical one. And that's the poem. <laughs>